So on this channel, we've discussed a number of theories of utilizing the mechanical energy of acoustic vibrations to overcome the effects of gravity. And in another series of videos, we discussed the potential of mechanical rotation to accomplish a similar goal via vortex lift. Vortex lift is a type of levitation which occurs from the direct action of rotation and centrifugal force on fluids and gases. But can the rotation of a heavy mass itself have some kind of direct interaction with gravity, which is independent of the vortices form formed in fluids and gases, being able to levitate even in a vacuum? In this video, I will discuss the concept of what is called the gravifugal force and its claimed ability to cause rotating objects to levitate. Let's start out with a quick review of gyroscopes and flywheels. A heavy uniform disc of mass m rotating at a given velocity has angular momentum and has the tendency to conserve that momentum just as any object moving in a linear path has momentum. Any force attempting to change the object's path of motion will experience an inertia or resistance to that change. This inertia being directly proportional to the speed of motion and the mass. This is what gives gyroscopes and flywheels their peculiar pseudo anti gravity like properties. Handling a heavy rotating mass is an interesting sensation, and if mounted properly, can result in precession due to conservation of angular momentum and inertia. It should be very similar to what actual anti-gravity and supergravity effects will feel like, even though technically the gravity of ordinary spinning objects is not being modified. The, concept, the conceptual document here takes the, the principle of angular momentum and inertia even further, giving it the name gravifugal force. It says here that the gravifugal force is a type of centrifugal force in which gravity has the function of a centripetal force. This means that gravity functions as a type of tether, keeping the rotating or revolving object from floating away from the rotating plane. The gravifugal force occurs in the cases of celestial bodies rotating on their axes, celestial bodies orbiting each other, orbiting satellites, space stations, and moons, as well as the rotation of a ring or disk within a gravitational field. It goes on to say that the gravifugal force occurs in cases of normal accelerations, such as those in which its counterpart, the, gravi the gravipedal force, acts. The mass of an orbiting body resists any change in direction of motion, and this resistance manifests as the gravifugal force. To better understand this, let's attempt a thought experiment. Let's say that we have a small metal ball at the end of an unbreakable string, orbiting an unbendable motor shaft spindle at a great angular velocity, very similar to the demonstration here, but much, much faster. Now let's imagine that we have a mechanism within the spindle which breaks its connection with the string and ball. The free ball is now propelled at a tangent to the orbital path and travels away from the motor spindle at terrific speed. Under normal circumstances, the ball would travel parallel to the ground, but only for a finite time until its velocity is slowed and it begins to follow an ever decreasing curved trajectory towards the Earth's surface under the influence of gravity. But let's say that mounted inside of this ball, is a miracle fuel conver converter, which can instantaneously convert the nitrogen, oxygen, and hydrogen in the ambient air into rocket fuel, and can do so indefinitely such that the loose ball maintains the same speed as it did when it left the motor shaft. Now, if this velocity is great enough, specifically about 17,000 miles per hour, then it will remain in the air at the same distance above the Earth's surface and it will not succumb to gravity. At this speed, a projectile 
will remain aloft even in a vacuum, at least until the ball's atmospheric converter runs out of backup fuel. The 17,000 mile per hour plus figure we know to be correct because this is the speed at which the space station must travel in space in order to maintain its distance from the Earth's surface. And so the concept of overcoming gravitation via rotation may be somewhat theoretical as to its full practical potential, but the ability of high-speed translational motion to overcome gravity is well proven and is demonstrated daily in orbital science with satellites at the space station. Another way that we know that this 17,000 mile per hour figure is true is that the centrifugal force resulting from the Earth's rotation slightly counteracts the gravitational weight of an object, particularly at the equator, resulting in apparent weight decreases of that same object or person of about 0.4% compared to the weight of that same object at the Earth's poles where the centrifugal force is zero. The Earth's ground speed at the equator is about 1,000 miles per hour. Speeding up the rotation of the Earth such that it completes a full revolution every one and a half hours rather than 24 would result in a ground speed 16 times faster at 16,000 miles per hour. So we see that this figure is close to the speed needed for the space station to remain airborne, or rather spaceborne. If the Earth rotated at that speed, the centrifugal force will overcome gravity and enable us to levitate just above the Earth's surface in what would essentially be low Earth orbit. So we can see that sufficient translational kinetic energy, if maintained at a constant value, can indeed overcome gravity. But let's go back to the metal ball projectile thought experiment. Let's say that we can travel fast enough to catch up to the projectile and match its translational speed, take the string and reattach it to the motor shaft, and convert its linear translational motion back into rotational motion without any energetic losses. The ball is now covering that same distance per unit time, but in a rotational path rather than a linear path. We can take an additional step and flatten the ball out into a homogeneous metal disc. We now have a disc rotating at tremendous speed. And so the question is, if we can rotate a disc or ring of a given dimension at sufficient speed, such that it covered the same distance per unit time as its ball form did translationally, then would it levitate in Earth's gravity? This centrifugal gravity concept is what is known in some circles as the afford-defined gravifugal force. And it is one of the core principles of Otis T. Carr's flying saucer propulsion concept. Though as far as I can tell, Carr himself never used this particular term when explaining his ideas. He did, however, mention that the angular velocity of a disk needed to overcome gravity would be related to the disk's diameter with higher velocities needed as the diameters decrease and slower velocities as diameters increase. We will discuss Carr's proposed system in greater detail in a separate video, but I wanted to highlight some of the interesting things which can happen when we subject heavy masses to large amounts of kinetic energy. Overcoming gravity and even the origin of mass itself is all about energy, whether that energy is in translational, rotational, or even vibrational or oscillatory form. With translational energy, we can see how a fast-moving satellite or any object for that matter, has a type of inertia, manifesting a resistance to any force or effect, which will alter that motion, including gravity. We see a very similar effect on a small scale by revisiting the gyroscopes and flywheels. Here I have a 15 inch diameter, seven pound flywheel mounted on a motor shaft and rotated at about 2,344 RPM which converts to 46.88 meters per second. As the disc rotates faster and faster, the mass becomes so resistant to changes in its angular momentum that it almost seems to defy gravity. Almost. 
Physics and force vectors can be used to represent and pre predict this behavior. But an intuitive way to understand it is that if you're moving the rotating mass along the path that it quote unquote wants to go, then it will work with you and the torque that would otherwise pull it down to earth will instead be redirected into a precessional motion. But if you travel in the direction that it doesn't want to go, then that torque will seem to increase and it will be even harder to hold it up. In the document here, a researcher by the name of Julio C. Gobi presents the idea that objects in motion actually generate inertial fields, which interact with the gravitational field in much the same way that magnetic field fields interact with the electric field, or more specifically, how moving charges can create their own magnetic fields which can then interact with an external magnetic field. He says, we are forced to admit that the constant gravitational potential that the satellite is submitted to in some form is neutralized by the constant velocity of the satellite. If this neutralizing effect does not occur, the satellite would not maintain a circular orbit. We know of two similar effects in, in electromagnetism, the Lorentz's force in which a moving electric charge or electric current inside of a magnetic field suffers a force per perpendicular to its trajectory and to the field, as well as the Faraday's induction in which an electric current produces a magnetic field perpendicular to it and a magnetic current can produce an electric field perpendicular to it. Considering the first effect, it is analogous to the Lorentz's force that occurs when electric charges tra travel with constant velocity inside of a magnetic field. A transverse electric field is established by the vector product as shown, and it exerts a centripetal Lorentz's force that puts the electric charge in a circular orbit. The same effect occurs with an electric current in a wire inside of a magnetic field but the satellite is like an electric charge that is not inside of a wire. So the force exerted on the electric charge is the cause of the charge moving in a uniform circular motion with an orbital radius r. He explains further that these electromagnetic force and field equations are very similar to the gravitational force and field equations that determine the centripetal acceleration of a satellite in a circular orbit of radius r. He concludes by saying that here is presented a new field called the inertial field and the mathematical treatment for the satellite's orbit in space, considering that the inertial current, which is the consequence of the orbital speed of the, of the satellite, neutralizes the gravitational field of the Earth by a type of gra gravitational induction. With this neutralization, it may be adopted a new interpretation for the gyroscopic effect that permits us to overcome gravity by spinning disks and rings in high rotation. So we can see that rotation can possibly generate a gravito inertial propulsion via the gravifugal effect. And we can understand these concepts not just in terms of inertia and momentum, but also in terms of equations that are similar to those in which electromagnetism is represented and understood. And what about vibrating or oscillating masses? Here I have what I call a linear mass resonator. It consists of a cylindrical weight of about 3.865 pounds set atop of a compression spring. Magnets mounted on the bottom of the mass are stimulated by the solenoid at the spring's resonant frequency. What I notice in handling the device when it is energized is that it has a similar feeling to that of the rotating mass of a gyroscope or flywheel. But whereas the resistance to rotating masses are in the curved plane or a path, the inertial resistance of the vibrator man manifests in the linear plane. It is particularly noticeable when shaking it parallel to its axis. If I shake it in phase with its movements, then it is easier to handle but it feels heavier when my movements are out of phase with its own. Thus we might see how a heavy mass oscillating or vibrating 
might be momentarily easier to lift or shove if the external forces are in phase with its periodic motion. And so this all brings up an interesting question. What will happen if we greatly increase the amounts of energy in these inertial systems? Many experiments with gyroscopes and flywheels that I've seen rarely exceed the rotational velocity greater than 12,000 RPM. What if we multiplied the speed of the disk by a factor of 10 or even 100? This would be especially interesting as the kinetic energy of the system would increase by the square of that speed, which would be 110,000 respectively. Would we then begin to reach an energy level sufficient to read an actual reduction in weight or completely neutralize the weight of the rotating disk as previously claimed? And if a certain speed of a disk could completely counterbalance the effect of gravity to the point of neutrality, then would an even greater speed enable it to levitate and even carry a payload? This was just an introduction to the concept of the gravifugal effect. In a follow-up video, I will attempt to test this concept as theorized by Otis T. Carr using a rapidly rotating disk in a sensitive scale within a transparent testing chamber. A vacuum pump will be used to evacuate the chamber such that, unlike in the previous vortex lift videos, air will play no role in any achieved weight reduction or lift. Thanks for watching, and as always, stay tuned.